thanks Emil again for everybody who's uh, coming in. Like I said, we're doing a poll, uh, so you can click on polls there and you'll be able to have your say on that. Um, hello everybody, welcome to our Lunchtime Live. Thanks for giving up your lunchtime to check in with our open newsroom with the Good Information Project and the journal. Just to introduce myself, I'm Aoife Barry, I'm the MC today. I'm assistant news editor at the journal and I'm really delighted to have such a fantastic panel here to discuss this topic of gender equality. Um, we're going to talk about it from an Irish angle, from an EU angle. There's loads of stuff that we'll be chatting about over the next hour. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all have to say. So just introduce the panel first of all. Frances Fitzgerald, MEP, thanks so much for being here today. She's the vice chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament, EPP group spokesperson on women's rights and gender equality, and also Fine Gael MEP, of course, for Dublin. We've also got Hannah DC, who's Communications Director for the Institute of International and European Affairs. Thanks for being here, Hannah. Previously, Hannah's worked for the Irish NGO Women for Election, where she trained female candidates running for election. And she also worked in Brussels as an advisor to the president of the party of the Party of European Socialists and Social Democrats. And then last but not least, I have my colleague, Michelle Hennessy, who's senior reporter with The Journal. And she's been looking in depth at a lot of the issues we'll be talking about here today as part of the focus on the Good Information Project. So you'll get to hear some of the reporting that she's been doing as well too. Now, we'll start off with you, Michelle. We did a poll with the Good Information Project in Ireland, thanks, um, recently. And there's some really interesting results on that. It kind of sets the, the scene where we were asked, we asked people, Irish people, about the status of women in Irish society today. So I'll get you to run through some of the kind of top line answers that we got from that. So what did people tell us in that poll about the status of women in the home in Ireland, maybe for starters? Yeah, so one of the questions in the Ireland Things polling that we did ask people whether men and women were treated equally in a number of settings. So one of those settings was the home. Just one in five people in Ireland, according to our polling, think that women are treated equally in the home. And then a similar percentage believe women are treated equally in politics. Uh, just under 32 percent uh, say that there's equal treatment in the workplace. And then when it comes to media representation, 36 percent said they believe women are treated equally. Uh, access to healthcare had the highest score here with more than uh, 53 percent saying that they believe women are treated equally. But where it really gets interesting, I think, is, is when you dig down further into the responses. So while 22.6% overall believe men and women are treated equally in the home, just 13% of women believe that. Uh, and it's similar when it comes to politics. And in fact, across all of the areas, women uh, who were polled were more likely to say that women were not treated equally in all of those areas. Now, we also saw uh, a difference in responses depending on who uh, the respondents voted for. So the poll in a separate question, a more general question, asked whether women were treated less favourably, more favourably or equally to men in Irish society. 69% of Fine Gael voters and 55% of Fianna Fáil voters believe women are treated somewhat or much less favourably than men. Uh, and then for other political parties, the levels varied. Um, for Sinn Féin, it was 70%. For Labour, it was 85%. It was quite high among um, Green Party voters at 96%. It was highest among those who identify as solidarity or people before profit voters at 98%. It was lowest among AIM2 voters at 32%. Uh, and then 88% Social Democrats, Independents, 66%. So you can see that there's not just a disparity between perceptions of men and women in terms of equality in Irish society. There's also a difference across the spectrum of political leanings. It's so interesting when you look at those results and kind of drill down into them and see what they say about the specific cohorts. And I'm sure we'll touch off some of that when we go through the discussion and the rest of the, of uh, today. So thanks a million for that kind of broad overview there, Michelle. Um, just remind people if they're tuning in that you can put your questions into the Q&A section and the, the results of that poll as well. I'll be giving you the results of that and I'll be asking some questions too towards the end of the webinar, putting them to the panelists. Um, so I'm going to start off with a very broad question. You know, we heard there from Michelle about people's perception of gender equality at the moment. Um, Francis and Hannah, I'll start with you, Francis, on this one. How is progress on gender equality across the EU? Like, how is it going? I mean, are all states moving forward? Are some better examples than others? You know, even is it, what's Ireland's role in all of this? Is it possible to give a maybe top line view of how things are right now? Oh, well, it's, 
It's a very mixed view, actually. And uh, I guess if you ask the women in many of the countries, they'd be saying what Irish women are saying. Uh, there's quite a journey ahead. Sweden, Denmark and the Netherlands are making most progress. No question about that. There's a brilliant organization called IGA, which is the institute uh, that looks at European Institute of Gender uh, Equality. And they provide the statistics every year of what's happening. And so you get a good picture there. Some countries are very good in childcare. You know, the Nordics have always been fantastic on it. Uh, they're also very good on representation, uh, generally speaking. Uh, other countries, actually, women's rights are going back, I would say. Hungary, Poland, some other European countries are getting quite punitive about equality. You have about seven, six countries that won't sign the Istanbul Convention because they believe it's an excuse for LGBTQI, or they think that, um, you know, there's some constitutional problem with it, which I'm not sure that there is in those countries. Uh, but basically, they're not bringing in the protections the Istanbul Convention offers. So quite a mixed picture. I mean, I think superficially in Ireland, you know, we see that more women are entering, you know, third level again, more educational opportunities. But then, as you say, you keep using the, the phrase, if you dig down, when you dig down, what you begin to see are the problems uh, that are, you know, outstanding that make that institute say it's going to be 60 years before we get gender equality. And I always say, you know, that's very too long, certainly too long for some of us. Uh, but I think for most of us, we're amazed when we hear that it would take 10 years, not to mind 60 years, to achieve gender equality across Europe. So, you know, there's a huge amount of work to be done. And we have some new issues emerging as well that are very insidious, uh, you know, in the areas of, of pornography and prostitution, sex trafficking. Those areas, the statistics are incredible that women are being trafficked across Europe. So I would say a very very mixed picture. And yet we know that progress has been made in Ireland, legally, constitutionally, but quite a journey ahead. Would you agree with that, Hannah? Quite a journey ahead and a very mixed picture overall in the EU? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm glad Francis raised the Istanbul Convention piece because that was one of the things I was going to speak on as well. You know, I mean, it is it is almost hard to believe, you know, um, a legal instrument that's 10 years old, that there are European Union countries that they don't want to ratify it. Um, and even some signatories who've announced their intention to withdraw, Poland announced its intention to withdraw in uh, the summer of 2020. I think the mixed bag is really epitomized by um, something I was reading about earlier this week. Um, Emmanuel Macron, obviously, is the French presidency of the European Council at the moment. He went to the European Parliament and gave his speech. I'm sure Francis knows the content better than I do, having been there. But um, you know, he mentioned this aim within the French presidency to look at including abortion and the right to abortion in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And um, now there is a right to life in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, but that's explicitly linked to the death penalty. So it's, it's not something that is, you know, particularly a, a pro-life provision uh, in, in the abortion debate um, sense of the term. Uh, yet, while the French presidency can make this statement, which I'm sure, you know, many uh, women across Europe would really applaud. In Poland, abortion has become so restrictive that it's it's almost worse than in Ireland pre um, the ref recent referendum. You know, there's a very uh, case, harrowing case that's been reported on recently in Poland about a woman called, a 30 year old woman called Isabella, who died of septic shock. And very similar to the, the Savita case, harrowing text messages have been entered into the court proceedings there between her and her mother. It's a complete rollback. Um, and so yet you have European member states with these really vastly differing views and the European Union centrally left to try and work out a path to keep everybody on the same page broadly um, whilst dealing with these vastly different um, situations. One thing that I would say that has changed um, for the positive very noticeably over the past number of years um, is in gender balance in political representation across EU member states and um, in terms of particularly government cabinets and, um, you know, the new German coalition has eight men and eight women in government. And, and that's a huge step forward. The Spanish government and the Finnish government are majority female ministers. I think that really does make a difference. And for decades, we've focused on the female figurehead and, you know, Angela Merkel. But when Angela Merkel was in the European Council during the Eurozone crisis, there were two women in the room. And, uh, you know, so that a government that's half male, half female is, is I think, necessarily going to have an advanced legislation that's more gender sensitive um, than, than government that's led by one woman with, with a few other female ministers. That's not to say that's not important, 
but it is certainly easier to tear apart a figurehead than a broad group. Um, so I do think that that's a big positive. And there are now five women in the European Council and they are all from Nordic states except for Estonia, so also close to the Nordics. But nonetheless, it's it's still a positive. You know, there were very, very few women in the room during the Eurozone crisis. And um, these things do really matter. You're highlighting a lot of um, issues there that we're definitely going to get into later on in, in the discussion um, about women in politics. Um, you know, the, the kind of decisions as well made during, during the, the COVID crisis. Um, just to go to childcare for a minute, because this is a huge issue that does um you know, it's highlighted a lot, I think, in some of what, what you were saying there. And it was definitely highlighted by the respondents to that Ireland Thinks poll um, that we did. So we asked them what we thought were the what they thought were the key items to resolve in order to further gender equality in Ireland. And top of the list was access to universal state funded childcare. Um, now, Francis, would you be able to talk about the EU and Irish efforts uh, to tackle this particular issue of childcare, given that it has such a kind of an ongoing effect on people's lives, women's participation in the workplace, well, etc.? I, I, I think it's absolutely critical. I had three sons my, myself. I mean, combining work and family life, um, for, you know, for men and women, this is sort of the way of the world now. It's what a lot of people make a choice around to combine. And yet it is so difficult to combine if you don't have, you know, as they say, high quality, affordable, accessible childcare. Now, Ireland has made, you know, great strides in this area, but actually the, the only solution is to put far more money into it and to make it a universal service accessible to all. Now, France, Sweden, they all vary. You know, there's some contribution from parents and I certainly wouldn't rule that out, but it's got to be more affordable than it is in Ireland at present. And we have to keep an eye on standards. Now, I would say to you, Aoife, that this is linked to the whole question of care. If we started taking care from childcare to elder care uh, more seriously, I was just doing a call this morning with a fantastic woman from Turkey who's done a whole lot of research showing how, as she calls it, the purple economy makes sense. That if you start investing in care, first of all, you deal with particularly women's poverty, but you also deal uh, with job creation and contribution to the economy. Governments very often, actually right across Europe, think if you invest in social care services, it's only going to cost the country. In fact, there's great um, you know, positives that come out of it as well. So I think uh, I asked the European Commission to develop a care strategy last year and Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the commission, announced that Europe is now going to do a, a care uh, strategy. And that's terrific. But, you know, it's in some parts of Europe, you know, care is just seen as something that, you know, uh, the family do. There isn't anything at all uh, from a public point of view. Um, other countries have more systematic approaches. Ireland, again, is a bit in between where it's kind of dependent on family to a degree. We have carers allowance. We have, you know, some respite and so on. But this issue of care is fundamental to women's equality. And I really want to see much more focus on looking at the economic benefits of it. Uh, uh, this is an area that has hardly been touched. And I think it's an area, it's a cutting edge area for the future. Um, dealing with the care issues is, as I say, fundamental to women having opportunities and women and men being able to make the kind of decisions that I think young people want to make now. And sticking with you, Francis, for a second there as well, um, kind of two related questions. One is about whether this speaks to the how we see the value of, of caring, whether caring is even valued in society. And then related to that, I know you in particular would have an interest in the idea of the sandwich generation when it comes to caring and carers. Could you speak about both of those? Yes, well, I mean, I, I think uh, to take up your your last point, I mean, uh, of course, what people find is they move from caring for young people to then in, in middle age, having older parents and transferring uh, their care attention to older parents. Now, many people will decide, you know, of course, uh, to spend time at home or to spend time looking after elderly parents. But the point is, it is so inbuilt, going back to your first question, mm -hmm. that it's really assumed. It's the assumptions we make about who does the caring. And we saw this during COVID. We saw that there was um, quite an increase um, in women. Uh, men did more caring. We do, we do know that. They got more involved in the caring issues and the, and the care. Uh, but still, it's predominantly uh, women. Now, there's always individual differences.
differences, of course. And, you know, younger couples may have more equal relationships. We're seeing some evidence of that. But still, um, it's, it's never been valued enough. I mean, 30 years ago, when I was chair of the National Women's Council, we talked about valuing the work of women in the home. We talked about um, opportunities, about combining work and family life. We're still talking about it. So the debate does go on. And uh, it's unfinished business. And I often talk about our democracies as, you know, unfinished democracies. And this is part of that unfinished democracy. And it's going to take all of us working together, political leaders getting more and more tuned into it, and the finances going into these areas. Um, but it's still an uphill battle, I would say. Yeah, I mean, Hannah, I'll go to you next in terms of that uphill battle. It's, it is striking to hear about, you know, 30 years and how much has changed since the, since the kind of decisions were made about what to campaign for. Um, looking at this idea of sustainable childcare, though, and looking to maybe a Europe basis, are there ideas that we can pull from that, you know, Ireland could learn from to build a more sustainable childcare model? Like, are there good things being done there that we can actually learn from? Because clearly there are lessons there to be learned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's there's very clear and um, the biggest difference is whether childcare is seen as a public service and part of the education system or whether it's a, you know, private service, um, or, you know, kept within the private sector um, that parents have to seek out themselves. And, and I think, you know, Francis alluded to it there. Um, Ireland is sort of in between in that previously our child care system and all of our care system was something that was managed by families alone or, you know, minders in the neighbourhood. And now we have, you know, more, um, you know, grouped child care settings in terms of creches. We haven't transitioned to that being a, a public or community model. There are great community creches in Ireland, but they're few and far between. They're very hard to access. Um, and, and I think actually if we started by expanding our own community childcare model, um, you know, we, we'd be a step towards what's going on in Europe. You know, my friends from when I lived in Brussels who have now have young children there, you know, their children are all in, in, in uh, creches run by the communes they live in, so the local authorities that they live in. They pay, you know, vastly less than I pay for my son to go to creche in, in Dublin. And... Um, the, the, the whole setup is just a lot more flexible. And, and I think that anchoring within the community is really, really important. The issues in Ireland are multiple, you know, it's accessibility, it's affordability, and it's terms and conditions for the workers in childcare settings in Ireland, vastly different um, in terms of uh, how we regard people who work in early education and care. You know, I, I have a friend in France and he works um, as what's called in French, a periculteur, it's a, an education specialist of, of the very young. Um, you know, that, that is a job that is seen the way we see teachers. Um, and that's exactly how we should be shifting um, now here in this country. Um, and, I, and I do think it's a hangover from when minders were um, women who kept children in their house, right? And of course, that was great that they were doing that, but it's a vastly different thing that we're talking about now. It's a regulated system, which is positive, And we know that that's a positive, but the state investment is the core piece for Ireland. That's the difference. You know, 1% investment in childcare is the UNICEF recommended target. France, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, they're all over 1%. We, we invest 0.3% of GDP GNI. So, you know, it's just not comparable um, in terms of scale. But the core piece of your question, what's going on in other European countries? The answer is greater investment and greater state involvement. Um, and that doesn't mean parents don't pay fees and it doesn't mean provider private providers don't exist, but that there is an accessible public option um, and that's what we're lacking here. And in, in those countries, is there an emphasis on caring and childcare is not just uh, you know, the mother's job, bearing in mind that obviously families take all different forms, you know, is there an emphasis on, on men, on, on it being a gender equality issue as opposed to one parent's job to look after this? Yes. And I think it's, you know, it's, it would be easy to say it's a sort of chicken and egg situation, which comes first. I mean, I think, you know, the provision of, of quality childcare um, that doesn't draw on one parent's availability more than on the others probably helps with that. Um, and there's a social mores element, of course. And um, I think, you know, when Francis mentioned the, the, the pandemic there and the impact that has had here and everywhere in terms of child bearing, rearing, uh, responsibilities within the home. I think actually there's been a big step forward in terms of gender equality within families in that, in terms of exposure of two parents, where there are two parents to the child and particularly around newborns and the non-birth parent, you know, typically a father 
being present in the in the early months and full first year on a day to day basis. I think that will be really positive going forward. I think we'll see a knock on impact of those fathers having a deeper relationship with the caring responsibilities of their their children's requirements, essentially. And I've seen that with colleagues. I've seen it with my partner's colleagues, vastly different. When our son was born in 2019, my colleague took, uh, my partner (laughs) took a full month off, right? And at the time it was two weeks that you could get. And there was shock among his colleagues. Now it's a month and people are taking a month. But his colleagues who had children this year, you know, they're used to having in the house every day with their baby and they love it. And and that's really positive. And I think that will have a huge impact for women around uh, postnatal mental health and um, return to work. Because I think if you feel better after your baby uh, is born, you're more likely to want to go back to work. And, and, and that's very, very powerful. So that's one of the conversely positive impacts of, of the pandemic around parenting, I suppose. Most of it has been stress. <laughs> Yeah, very, it's very true, actually. One of those really interesting kind of elements to it. And, and just for people interested in this topic as well, we're going to have a very comprehensive study of what might constitute a kind of sustainable child care system in the Good Information Project. It's coming up this weekend, so people keep an eye out on the, on the journal for that. Um, for everyone everybody tuning in as well don't forget you can leave your questions in our Q&A section as well towards the end of the conversation and about 15 minutes to go to the end uh, to the hour I'll be asking them and going through some of those questions with their panelists as well so please do put them in we're really interested to hear what you're really interested in hearing about um let's go now to the topic of violence against women um which was something that really was highlighted in our poll um when we ran the poll this month the Ireland Thinks poll it was the second most chosen answer about when it came to advancing women's rights People said that penalties for violence against and abuse of women should be increased to you know, further gender equality. Now, it's just to note that we carried out this poll at the start of January. It was before the horror of what occurred um, to Ashley Murphy in Tullamore. Um, the eradication of, of violence against women. Francis, what needs to change there? I mean, what policies are really needed in order to tackle this huge issue that people are talking so much about, particularly at the moment? Well, I... I think the first thing is to recognise the scale of it. Every study we have, both in Ireland, across Europe, across the world, is saying this is a most serious issue. So it's about facing up to that. And once you begin to face up to it, rather than reacting to you know individual horrific incidents, you have to look at it cumulatively. And you know the stats vary a little bit, but they do show very high numbers of women in Ireland either know somebody or experienced violence themselves or sexual harassment, the continuum of sexist attitudes and violence. So it's a very serious issue. And I, I mean, I find myself saying, what sorts of societies are producing this level of violence? So you have to begin with that question. And then, you know, some of the answers are that we live still live in very sexist societies. Actually, there's a lot of everyday sexism. Um, and it's a phrase I think about quite a bit because I think most women experience it on an ongoing basis in a variety of forms. So to deal with violence against Against women. Um, you have to think about that as a societal issue. You then have to talk about all of the things that contribute to that. So I, let's begin with education. You know, it's about making sure that we are, uh, for example, uh, doing sex education properly. I met with some young women from across Europe recently and was actually quite horrified to learn that uh, in many countries, sex education is still very, very poor. Um, maybe we have an idea in Ireland that, you know, maybe in France or Spain or somewhere else, it's, uh, it's, it's much better. It's not. So that's a real issue from the early days in school. It's attitudes to boys and girls when they're in primary school. I think seeing, you know, co-ed uh, primary schools is fantastic to see them working together on environmental issues, respect for one another. It, it begins very basically like that. and It begins in the home. I think legislation really matters. So, for example, when I was Minister for Justice, the issue of coercive control was being discussed. That's now in legislation. Consent, bringing consent into the legislation. Um, the, a strong legislation matters. And there are new issues emerging. Um, it could be stalking. Uh, that's something that maybe we weren't that conscious of X number of years ago. So you have to update your legislation all of the time. I think training is terribly important with the guards in emergency, uh, in the emergency departments and hospitals. We have to then provide the services to people, the supports, so that people can leave violent situations. That's about supporting our NGOs and those who are providing frontline services. Now, all of this is much better than it was 
you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, more money is being given. But actually, again, it's about the scale. It's somehow trying to make sure these equality issues are seen at the scale uh, that they're really at, and then having a response that's commensurate with that. And often the response, and I, I can see this after, you know, during my years in politics, I mean, having a critical mass of women, I know you're going to go on and talk about this, there is evidence that, and Hannah mentioned this, when you have a critical mass of women taking the decisions in cabinet, in government, in leadership, uh, then you begin to have these these topics, these important issues, more on the agenda of, of governments, more policy in relation to them. And I've seen that myself. So the, all of these things are interconnected. And then there's societal awareness. I think information, really high quality information campaigns that cost money like that one, you know, don't be a bystander. That makes a difference as well. So it's, it's, it's a whole range of issues and it's worldwide. If you look at FGM, what's happening in, the, in many countries around the world, you know, FGM went up during COVID. Forced marriages went up in developing countries uh, during the COVID pandemic. So, you know, this is a worldwide issue. Now, there are great initiatives, which we probably don't have time to talk about, but UN women are doing quite a lot. The EU is funding really good programs um, uh, across Europe and around the world to try and, you know, bit by bit it change this. We need male champions as well. I'll finish on that point. We have to have men, uh, you know, seeing that they are part of this because it's very often it's male violence on females and therefore all men have an obligation to interrupt sexism and to work on this issue. It has to be on the shoulders of men as well. Absolutely. And and Michelle, you did a really interesting um, piece for the journal for the Good Information Project about this issue. You specifically looked about how um, harassment of women had increased online over the pandemic. Um, can you tell us kind of what you discovered when you were doing your reporting and who you spoke to about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll all on the panel know that online harassment and abuse of women is not a new phenomenon. And, you know, it's not something that only started during the pandemic, but it does seem to have got worse. Now, we don't have a huge amount of solid data on this, but we do have some. And what we do have points to quite a worrying situation. I mean, over the last two years, women have been spending more time online, but it was less of a choice. So it meant that women across the world had to be online, whether it was for their schooling, if they're in higher education or for their work or just to make maintain some semblance of, of a social life to keep in touch with family and friends who they couldn't see because of restrictions. Um, now, experts I spoke to said that this increased presence online put women at an increased risk of being targeted by, by this type of abuse and harassment. And there was a UK survey in January last year that found nearly one in two women who had experienced sexual harassment at work reported that some to all of it was online. Now, just to put that into context, that's a substantial jump from the pre-pandemic situation. There was a UK government report in 2019 that found just 5% of workplace sexual harassment was online. Most of it was in the physical workplace. It was at social events. Uh, it was at client meetings. Now, obviously, you know, there, there haven't been the opportunities in many workplaces for this kind of behaviour to happen in the physical workplace because they've been closed due to restrictions. But what this shows is that even when women removed themselves or were removed from those physical spaces, is where the harassment was taking place, it followed them. And it didn't just follow them into an online space, it followed them into their homes because that's where they were working. So you can imagine the impact that that would have had, you know, that change um, that, you know, you don't just get to leave this kind of negative abusive behaviour behind in the office, but it's actually happening in your home now. Um, another area in which we do have data is in the pol political sphere. Um, there was recent research uh, published by data scientist Dr. Ian Richardson, who I spoke to for the article as well, uh, and he found that female councillors in Ireland received eight times as many abusive tweets per follower than their male colleagues on Twitter. Now, this research was based on, on Twitter activity uh, in a 12-month period over 2020 and 2021. So this was right in the middle of the pandemic, this activity was happening. And I mean, we know that women who are high-profile politicians, journalists, activists, uh, women who are in top positions in businesses, they're all more likely to be targeted online. And really Research shows that this abuse and harassment can impact on their willingness to engage with the online world and also to pursue and remain in the types of leadership positions that other women need to see them in in order to, to want to do that themselves. Pretty shocking statistics there. I mean, Hannah, when you think about this online abuse um, of women in particular, and, and online abuse that you know obviously takes place across all people of all diff different backgrounds, but looking at the kind of gender gender aspect, 
what can be done about this? I mean, is it down to the social media platforms? Is it down to the government to regulate them? Is it down to people to regulate their own behavior? Is it a combination of all the above? Is there any immediate solution that can come to mind? Um, well, I mean, I think there is a combination. You know, there is absolutely an onus on social media companies to, to step in. And they've been improving over recent years, but I mean, you know, there's still a huge body of work to be done there in terms of, you know, response timelines, how quickly um, they get involved and um, the criteria as well. Um, and then equally, yeah, I think there is a role for legislation. You know, I mean, Francis, you know, referred to several pieces of legislation in, in terms of the, the broader arc of whereas Ireland and compared to other EU countries, I think coercive control is actually a great indication of somewhere where we're ahead of other countries. You know, that was really quite a pioneering um, piece of legislation. And um, so there is a role for legislation as well. Um, and then I suppose the, the other piece, you know, personal responsibility is that term we all use now. I, I think that's an education piece. And I think that just links this into the broader continuum and spectrum of um, violence against women, harassment and everyday sexism. And, you know, obviously the start of this year for Irish women has been a moment of, um, you know, great sadness and, and trauma collectively um, in response to, you know, the horrific murder um, that took place. But um, the one difference I felt this time around, because obviously all of the high profile cases or less high profile cases like, you know, Nadine Lott or um, Anna Kriagel, you know, Justine Valdez, all of them, remind you how scary just being alive can be and how random um, you can just be living your life one moment and then all of a sudden no more. I think the difference in the conversation this time is the connection and the connecting thread between you know minor incidents of everyday sexism and I have been encouraged that we're having that national conversation more now than previously and um, I do think that very often we try to ignore the reports and brush them under the carpet and, you know, you hear horrific details of a specific case and then move on. But there is a continuum and that's the culture piece. And it's hugely important that we address the culture piece collectively um, and, you know, education in all its forms in the sense that, yes, as Francis said, sex education, but the structure of our schooling and co more co-ed schools and access to co-ed schools. I mean, that has to be a huge part of acknowledging um, the way in which we treat men and women differently starts right at the very beginning of life. And, and, and that's, that's problematic and it's challenging and it's troubling and it has a knock-on impact to all of our interactions. And um, yeah, so it's, there's responsibility everywhere, but I do think that there is an onus on policymakers um, to really engage this time with what are the structures within which our society that particularly uphold gender inequality mm -hmm. and how can we like how can we address those how can we change them absolutely i think that point you made about the kind of spectrum or continuum as well as something that's cropping a lot in these discussions when it comes to kind of violence against women or sexism that, that sort of behavior um we'll move just to covid and then connect with that we'll move to the idea of, of women in power and women in politics um francis i'll start with you with this question about covid is it fair to say that the burden of COVID has fallen more heavily on women over the last two years or so? Well, we're getting more and more evidence about this. And, you know, uh, more older men have died from COVID very sadly. But I think when you look at the uh, socioeconomic impacts of COVID, you begin to see that there is a differential effect on women and men. And there's more work to be done on this. The Swedish presidency in the EU is coming up now uh, in another six months. And there's more work going to be done to look at the sort of medium term, what are the impacts? And then we have to look at the longer term impacts. But yes, I think it's true to say that from a, a care point of view, uh, clearly the burden of care, generally speaking, the figures speak for themselves, does fall disproportionately on women. Um, you are seeing women opting out of the workforce completely as a result of some of the pressures because, you know, working from home is no substitute from, for childcare. And of course, you know, we have to see childcare as essential uh, during a, a pandemic and every other time or an epidemic. So uh, that's a very important point. Um, I think disproportionately uh, women's uh, employment has been impacted because women, you know, we know the areas that women still predominate in, in you know, in retail and uh, hospitality and all of those those home services, as it were, um, they've been really impacted during COVID. So, yes, I think that is true to say, and you have that 30% uh, increase in domestic violence as well.
well. So um, I think COVID has been very tough uh, for many women. I think remote working it can be a real boom for, uh, for women and men, for women, uh, because you get that flexibility sometimes. But you've got to make sure, sure that it's, you know, you get the other supports that you need if you are working from home and you've got young children. So um, the picture does seem to be generally that it has been, look, it's been demanding on everyone. Let's be clear on that. And uh, particularly, of course, older women who predominate in nursing homes. And so many of the, the deaths were in, in nursing homes. So again, you link back into the care issues that women in those nursing homes, women and men, were extremely vulnerable. So, I mean, it, it, what COVID did, it gave us a lens to see the inequalities, I think, that were already there. And it exaggerated them and made them tougher on individuals, and particularly, you know, on a lot of individual women. So I, I think it is true. I did a report for the Parliament here on the differential impact on women and men. And I called for, you know, a lot of action by the Commission, by the Council, by the Parliament. I think there's, there's initiatives we can take in every area um, to support uh, women going forward and particularly of course to be prepared for uh, you know which it was very difficult to do on this occasion it was I think unexpected by the vast majority of people but we do really have to look at all of these issues now and accelerate action on them I, I conclude on this point by saying one thing every member state has got a huge amount of money from the EU. They borrowed more than ever before. We've seen that money flow through into Ireland. We've got to make sure that the recovery is gender sensitive and that we have gender budgeting because the plans that came in from the various member states were not so hot on gender. And uh, that's one of the criteria. And if this money is going to be spent, I mean, there's I think it's estimated 90% of the jobs in the future are going to need digital skills. 70% of people say that they, uh, businesses say when they're trying to recruit people don't have digital skills. So are we going to make sure that women get that training in the next, you know, two, three, four, five years ahead? Are we going to make sure that our training programs, our apprenticeships and so on, where this money has been spent on green and digital, that women will be included? It doesn't happen automatically. You actually need the experience uh, and people who know about gender, you know, helping to inform policies in the finance area and in the spending of this money. Yeah, and I think your answer there, Francis, really speaks to the next question as well, definitely, that I'm going to ask. And before I get to that, um, if people do have questions, they can pop it into the Q&A box. Um, our poll is still open. I'll be giving you the result of that. So just click where it says polls and you can answer that. And we go into the Q&A in about maybe five or 10 minutes or so. Um, but just to speak to what Francis was saying there, and Francis, I'll come back to you actually first maybe on this, because I'll get you I'll get all three of you to, to answer on this. Um, speaking about COVID and speaking about the idea of women in power and women in politics, when it came to the decision making around COVID, I think a lot of people would have seen that the people around the tables in Ireland, certainly when it came to kind of policy making and decisions, it wasn't, there wasn't always gender parity, shall we say, at those tables. Do you think, I'll start with you, Francis, on this, that different or maybe even better decisions might have been made had there been gender equality around those important tables of people making those decisions during this period? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it sort of came slowly in Ireland. You began to see the emergence of more women who were, you know, female GPs, scientists and so on. Uh, but very often it was being fronted by, you know, because political leaders in Ireland, the vast majority, uh, are male, it tended to be fronted by, by men. And I, I don't think that's good because I think you absolutely have to see and better decisions are taken. Of course they are. If you have women and men uh, and, and if you have people working together uh, as opposed to one gender uh, or, or any gender, you know, making uh, all of the decisions. And uh, it, it, it's never as good an outcome, in my view. You've got to bring the different experiences together. And uh, we saw that during COVID and this, you know, fascinating research about uh, how women uh, in, in, the, in the academic area produce less papers uh, during COVID. Now, you know, it's very, we can work out why. It's the pressures they were under. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of interesting pieces. And in broadcasting terms, um, at the beginning, when it came to science, it tended to be, you know, male scientists were, you know, and you just think about the role modeling. Girls aren't taking up STEM subjects as much as they should. They're, it's going down. So, you know, if you look at all of the scientists who were coming on and they're all men talking about, you know, COVID, well, you know, you think about what impact is that having on young women who might just be beginning to have an interest in science? So, yes, I mean, I, I think it does matter. I, I think it's it's not good. Uh, and in broadcasting the same. I mean, very often, you 
you know, we, we spent a long time talking about, you know, who's being represented in, on our media. And uh, that's an ongoing issue as well. So, you know, I, I, I think, look, the awareness is so much better than it ever was. It, the situation in terms of representation is improving, but it's a hell of a long way to go. Irish politics, you know, 22 percent of women in the doll in this era when we have so many well-educated women who are interested, with so many women working in their communities. I mean, the, the barriers are still too high. Yeah, absolutely. And Hannah, I'll put the same question to yourself and then to Michelle, your thoughts on that. Yeah, and look, I mean, I think there's there's many incident, instances during the pandemic where we saw the lack of women in the room making decisions. You know, I mean, sometimes I think there were no women in, in the room in, in certain configurations that was widely reported on. I think, you know, one of the more humorous um, examples was the fact that children's shoes were unavailable for a very, very long time, but hardware shops were always on the list of essential businesses. So, you know, I mean, that speaks for itself, really. Um, and, and the shoes thing, you know, became quite serious for lots of family. You know, a court pediatrician spoke about it in the media. My son was tripping a lot. You know, we thought he might have a walking problem because his shoes didn't fit. They had been bought online, you know, I mean... Um, so there's that, but then there's a very serious side of things like the maternity hospital restrictions and the deep trauma that's been visited on a cohort of women and men, um, families, you know, just tr deep, deep trauma that people have gone through things alone that they never should have had to do. And, um, you know, that is really damaging, I think. Um, and, and then there's, there's broader pieces. I often remember talking at moments of various lockdown announcements to friends as to, you know, why couldn't there be guidance given to employers, central guidance around how to manage um, staff with young children working from the home with their children because their creches were closed, you know, and greater guidance on flexible hours for those, for those families, you know, all of those kinds of things. If you had people thinking about that in the room, we could have had those outcomes. And um, on the broader representation piece, yeah, of course, things are improving. I mean, I think in the goal, you know, we saw great progress with the first general election with gender quotas in 2016. We jumped up and we, we stayed around 22, 23% after the second general election with the gender quota. And now it will go up to 40%. That's positive. I think we need it in the local elections to, to continue to have an impact. Um, and we do have demonstrable evidence that it, it has an impact. I mean, the, the, the Shannon at the moment has uh, close to 40% women in it. And there's really interesting legislation being brought far, forward by the Shannon at the moment um, in relation to gender equality, the period products legislation brought forward, um, and now the reproductive leave bill. And, um, you know, those are um, le pieces of legislation that I do believe are informed by lived experience, you know, and they're informed by women being alive and thinking about the challenges of being alive and listening to other women talk to them and, uh, and other people. And, and that's the impact, you know, there, it makes a difference. Um, but we're not there yet. The, the pace of change is glacially slow. It, it often feels that way. And, um, and again, coming back to cabinet ministers, you know, I spoke earlier on about the advances being made in, um, other European countries, but, you know, as Francis will well know, our maximum number of women in any cabinet is four, and we, we have been stuck on four women in cabinet for um, at least three or four governments now. Um, that's, you know, a real shame, I think. It's a travesty, and it, it needs to be addressed urgently. I think the women of Ireland should talk to, every time they see any political representative of any level, they should raise it. Um, it's not good enough anymore. And Michelle, what would your thoughts be on that, especially given the reporting that you've been doing for the Good Information Project of the last kind of month or so? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the types of policy decisions that we saw during the pandemic, the main theme I've been hearing when I asked the question is that things were overlooked and important things were overlooked. And when I spoke to Orla O'Connor, director of the National Women's Council of Ireland, she brought up something from the early days of the pandemic that I had forgotten about. That was actually quite a big story at the time. Um, women who were on maternity leave were initially not included in the pandemic um, subsidy payments and it was quickly remedied but what Orla said is that she was being told at the time you know oh well women weren't intentionally left out women on maternity leave um, you know we just didn't think of it and as she pointed out that's the problem that says a lot that nobody around that table who was making the decisions around this thought what about this large cohort 
cohort of women that don't tick that box or that box. Uh, and there were other examples um, that we saw, again, the early days, um, childcare issues for, for healthcare workers. In the early days, people remembered that the schools were closed, the creches were closed, and you couldn't even have a child minder or a family member into your home to mind your children. And somehow nobody around the table thought, well, what about the frontline workers who also have children who are now at home? And there was a difference we saw in, in the reactions to other countries versus Ireland. I mean, when this happened in the UK, a solution was quite quickly put in place. Uh, the childcare solutions were basically opened back up for frontline healthcare workers. But here, there was a bit of a kind of dithering around what we should do. There was a lot of discussion about it before any kind of solution was put in place. And the types of solutions were, were really, you know, oh, well, you can, you can if you work for the HSC, you can apply to, to work from home. But for patient-facing workers, that was not a reality. That was never going to happen. Some of the other solutions were, were based around, you know, asking family members to, to pitch in with the childcare. And I think um, this kind of touches on a point that Francis was making earlier. I mean, in the UK, the state stepped in and said, we're taking control, here's what you do. In Ireland, it was, you know, ask your parents to do it, ask your parents to step in. And for a lot of uh, particularly workers who, uh, frontline workers working with COVID patients who were working in hospitals that had outbreaks, or those working in nursing homes who had outbreaks who, who were care workers, they didn't want to have that kind of physical interaction with their with their older parents. Remember, this was pre-vaccine. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff that was coming through was that women and the kinds of um, policy decisions that were going to impact women, it was an afterthought. And, you know, it, it would be brought up and then the government would go, oh yeah, sorry, but that will fix that. But it's, it, it was the fact that they weren't thought of in, in the equation in the first place. Yeah, the omission of those things that wasn't done on purpose, but actually ended up having a huge, huge impact. That's like, that could be the very tough thing for people to kind of have to deal with the, the impact of that. Um, now we do have a Q&A coming up momentarily. So I'll very quickly get you to answer my last question. And thanks so much for all, all of your input here. I, mean, I could spend all day talking to you about these these topics. Um, I'll start with you, Michelle, and then go to Hannah and then give yourself, Francis, the last word on our, on our last question, um, which looks to the future. So if we're looking at gender equality and how to achieve it in, in the future rather the near future than the distant future, are there particular landmarks, one or two things that you think will have to be achieved in order to get us there? So, you know, for example, if we look to the past, you might think of the marriage bar being um, over being ended, for example, um, is there is there an idea that that you can think of that's similar to that that you think this needs to occur, and then we'll know that gender equality is coming down the line. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that piece that that Hannah mentioned in terms of seeing more women in higher positions. I mean, seeing a. a gender equal cabinet makeup, for example, would be really important. Um, There's a, a piece that we have on the site this morning that I wrote uh, about the, the political side of things. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're not seeing for some reason the, the transition from the council to the doll uh, with female politicians in the same way that we should. Um, but interestingly, women are, are more successful when it comes to being elected to the European Parliament. Um, and I mean, some of the things that were coming through in those conversations were, were that, you know, maybe voters trust women in, in more far out remote places of politics or with seemingly softer issues like um, like th they might see that the European Parliament is not dealing with things that, that affect them every day, even though it actually does impact on their lives every day. Uh, I think that that visibility piece is, isn't there. Uh, and I think that that's something that that could change. That if women are seeing, you know, a female Taoiseach or, uh, you know, half the, the cabinet are, are ministers or, you know, the women in top positions uh, in, in businesses, um, I think that that makes a difference. I mean, for me personally, a big landmark would be not writing about this as an issue anymore. If, if that was, that, that, that's the aim is that, you know, it's not newsworthy anymore uh, to, to write about gender equality because we, we've made it there. Uh, and, and it, you know, it's not really a topic for me. That would be personally the aim you and a lot of journalists I'd say <laughs> and about, what about yourself um yeah I mean it's, it's hard to, to pull out specific measures isn't it because mm. you know as we've just been discussing it's it's all so interconnected um I, I think you know childcare look is one you know it absolutely is in massive investment public investment in childcare can have a huge impact because it you know from the first point you know, it's better for children, but it empowers women in terms of their economic and um, uh, participation in society and, and the knock on impacts then are, are massive education overall of how, how we how we treat boys and girls in, in schools. I, I wonder from, you know, more top line position, we have had the Citizens Assembly on Gender Equality now. This committee been established in the Oireachtas, chaired by Vanna Bacic, to, um, to look at those recommendations. 
I wonder, is it now time to revisit the idea of a minister for gender equality? Um, you know, because there's, there's, this is conversation is so live in Ireland now. It's across so many areas of government. You know, would it be necessary or positive? Could it contribute in the same way the creation of the, the minister? of children I and mean, obviously it's a pleasure to have Frances speak after me on this because she can maybe speak to the impact that this could have but to bring together all the various pieces and strands and stakeholders and to make take action across all of government and perhaps a, you know a dedicated minister it, now is the time for, for that. Frances is now the time for a minister for gender equality? Well that's an interesting question uh, we have had that before. If you were going to have a, a Minister for Gender Equality, it would definitely have to be a senior minister at Cabinet and with the Taoiseach, you know, in there with response, you know, working closely to make sure that, you know, action was taken. That's the best way to get mm. to get action as senior ministries, like I was Minister for Children, first senior minister. It just gives you access to all the other departments because this, you know, you need a lot of departments taking action to change this. So, I mean, look, it's a Possibility. I mean, the time might be right for it. Uh, but, you know, what's really important is that all of the other ministers gender proof and equality proof their decision making. That's, you know, that's nearly as important. It's very important as well. Um, we have equality proofing a legislation, but we need it on all policies and we need it to be real. And I, I suppose if you ask me from a kind of visionary point of view, what do I want to see? You know, I want to see 50 percent of women in the doll. You know, it's, it's snail's pace. It's 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 ridiculous. It does make a difference. You get a much more, you know, broadly based discussion. It, you know, the decision making is better, and so on. So, you know, I'd really like to see that, and I want women to feel safe. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm really tired, and all of, all of us have realised lately, it's just not you or me or your sister or your mother uh, that feels unsafe. You know, women going around with keys in their hands to make sure, like we've got to create a society where in all spaces women feel safe. So you know, it's a huge agenda, and I, uh, I think the cry is strong now. But how do you keep it consistent? You know, it's a lot of it is a reaction to horrible events. How do you keep it sort of strong and? Consistent. I think there's great solidarity uh, amongst women. We've got to get the male leaders, the male decision makers taking this as seriously as they uh, might take something else. It's not just an add on. You know, I'd like to see, you know, gender not being seen as an add on, but as integral to the quality of our our communities and our politics. I mean, it's we have to have that wish because uh, if we don't, we're not going to get there. But the awareness is certainly, I, I do agree with uh, Hannah and what M Michelle were saying now, you know, it's uh, we have the data. There's a different quality of discussion at the moment. So let's hope it's a, it's a moment of opportunity to accelerate. I think accelerating the change is the point. You know, it's the pace needs to be, you know, it needs to be snappier than it's ever been. Yeah, the speeding things up would be certainly be great. It'd be great to do with all this conversation. And um, we just have time, I think, for one question from our Q and A, and it actually kind of ties in with what you were saying there, Francis. So I'll go to you first on it. Um, it's about what the panel think about quotas for gender representation in both politics and boards. So you know they were noting some very dispiriting figures there in terms of like three women CEOs in the S and P five hundred. Um, and you know generally, what are your thoughts on, on this issue? And maybe Francis, I'll go to you first. To uh, well, I've always being very clear on quotas you know there's a quota been operating on the side of men forever i think quotas are absolutely fine i don't buy into this oh you know it undermines the women i mean you know women will get there if they're you know good enough and have the qualities very often they're good enough and they have to be twice as good as some of the men and they don't make it so i think myself that quotas the un describes them as a you know uh, an, uh, you know short necessary for the time that you need them uh, and i think we need them right now um look you may have 30 30 or 40 percent of women uh, running in the quota for, for the doll or even for locals doesn't mean 30 or 40 percent of women are going to to be elected it's only a selection in some countries you have like for the european parliament in some countries they've list system you have to have you know a woman uh, and a man uh, you know every second one you know you have to have both genders uh, nominated uh, we don't we don't have that but we, we have the quota but it doesn't mean you get there so i i think quotas are symbolic we're going to and they're important we're going to bring in one now for women on boards, Ursula von der Leyen, I met her last week and she said that that's a priority for her as well. Because it matters when you're making decisions about consumer goods, about safety, about business, that women's voices are there as well. And they're not there in critical mass either in business. So, you know, let's hurry it up with the quotas. 
And Hannah, I'll go to you then finally on the quotas question as well, your answer on that. Yeah, I, mean, I don't disagree with anything Francis has said there. You know, there's obviously we have evidence and, um, you know, academic evidence surveys done and around the financial crisis and risk taking behavior and how having more women on boards at that time could have changed outcomes. But, you know, equally, I think in and around politics, there's been a very clear impact. Also, it's an interventionist model, you know, um, representative democracy was designed when women didn't have the right to vote. So, to, you know, assume that it could function in an egalitarian way is is based on nothing. So, you know, it, it, quotas is designed uh, as an intervention designed to rectify what we clearly know is demonstrable inequality in, in, in who represent people. And it's just a way of making democracy more representative, which is the system that we, you know, have and aspire to continue to improve. Um, and, and then it can have trickle down impacts too. One thing I meant to mention earlier on is, you know, the European Commission at the moment, there's more female commissioners than ever before. And that's a huge improvement too. But Ursula von der Leyen asked every member state to nominate a man and a woman. And that was an innovation and it's like an informal quota. But that was the way to ensure you would have a gender balanced uh, commission. Whereas, you know, uh, Juncker the time before had tried to get more female nominations from member state governments and failed. So even in that instance, using a sort of informal quota did help and makes a difference. So let's go to our poll just before we wrap things up. And thanks for your great, your great comments there. Um, so we asked people, how close are we to achieving gender equality across Irish society? 0% said we're already there. 0% said quite close. 14% said somewhat close, but plenty to do. 52% of the people responding to our poll today said not close, but moving towards it. And 33% said we've barely begun. So I'll leave you mull over, everybody watching mull over those particular viewpoints there. Um, thanks so much to our panellists, Francis Fitzgerald, MEP, Hannah DC of the IIEA, and our senior reporter, Michelle Hennessy, for being here today and for giving all of your really interesting viewpoints and thanks so much to the audience for spending your lunchtime with us um, we hope you gained some great insights there and some answers to your questions as well too and we'd love to hear um, from you about what you'd like to see covering on public transport which is our next topic for the good information project this it's all very reader led so do give us a shout let us know what you think you can get in touch by emailing good at the journal.ie and i think we'll be able to pop in the url in the audience chat there for both the newsletter if you'd like to sign up um, or the facebook group for the good information project as well so keep an eye there and hopefully we'll be able to pop those into the audience chat if not if at the journal.ie drop me an email and i will send you both of those on um, thanks so much to all of our panelists and thanks to everybody for tuning in